Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Today's guest is Deb Westfall, author of Convergence. Deb, welcome. Hi, Mark. I'm so excited to be here. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, I'm thrilled as well to have you here and it's a really well done book. And uh, the audience is really going to enjoy learning more about your book for sure. So let's start off with you giving us a little bit about your background. Tell us about your professional background. So my, uh, my professional background, uh, by education, I'm electrical engineer with an MBA. And uh, professionally, as far as career, I started with the Air Force as a program manager working on uh, advanced weapon systems, designing them and, and uh, kind of the advanced concepts. And then I moved into strategy consulting, where I spent, um, you know, 20 years helping other organizations with strategy and, and helping them create their a successful future for their for them and their companies. Uh, thank you for your service to country, working on those defense um, projects. Um, why did you write this book and, and why did you pick this title? Well, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> the title is Convergence, uh, Technology, Business, and the Human-Centric Future. And uh, in that, uh, I talk about these three major forces that I really see needing to be balanced and be considered, because I think at this point, they're, they're somewhat imbalanced or out of balance. And we have, um, you know, everybody feels the, the technology and the advanced technology and, and uh, what's happening and how fast it's moving. And, and uh, you know, so, you know, what does that technology mean to, to our businesses, especially when our businesses were created for really a very different time and a very different focus. And I talk about that, that over the last, you know, four or five, six decades, businesses have been really honed in on serving shareholders versus the broader stakeholder uh, portfolio that they really have responsibility to. And, um, you know, and with that, because of technology, because of, you know, the, the, the time that we're in, um, this third force is um, humanity. We're all connected. We can all communicate. Um, you know, there is a rise of, of activism and concern. And so, you know, as we think about these three forces in the very big macro view, uh, we need to balance those. And that's why I called it Convergence. And um, you asked why I wrote the book. It was really just to add my voice to the growing number of voices saying, you know what, there's some things that we're on the wrong path that we need to, um, to really slow down and, and take into consideration. And, um, you know, I want to add my voice to that. You know, an example would be, um, you know, how are businesses um, kind of serving that broader uh, stakeholder portfolio? How are they addressing some of the really hard problems of humanity, like fresh water or climate change or diversity or human migration issues, which they do have a responsibility in addressing. So that's, that's why I, I wrote the book is to, you know, be a part of that, uh, that conversation. And these kind of books are absolutely needed on a global basis, especially as people, and you talk about Larry Fink at BlackRock and others, and we're gonna get into um, his views on this and what he's doing at BlackRock. But let's start off with, What's your definition of humans, human centric, which is pervasive throughout your book? So I take the the idea of um, kind of stakeholder capitalism, stakeholder focus, and uh, and add that uh, that humanity dimension because you know in in the more the traditional maybe definition of stakeholder you've got your employees you the community your suppliers your customers but because our companies um, have become very very large in nature very global um, because of globalization even with small entrepreneurial companies are a part of that uh, that network 
that uh, there are some problems that are well beyond the communities and you know the immediate communities that you operate in. Um, you know, consider if you're a small company making a product that um, you know is uh, using a material that is mined over in Africa. You know, you have a responsibility to to kind of understand that because there might be some some long term effect to that community not just the community which you know your business resides and so that's why i expand it to um to humanity because of some of these very very hard problems that uh that really are overarching to all business yeah it's funny you, should, you know when you say that people don't realize even at home by the fact that certain areas like houston got so built up there's no work where for the water to run off so it causes extensive damage in the billions. At the end of the day, we end up paying for that anyway. So there's a real price to be paid for any of these things. You know, it, it really is. We think about um, fast fashion is one of them that, you know, kind of gets to me is you can crank out this stuff um, we, we very, very rapidly. It's very cheap. Um, it is advertised on social media. It's a click away to buy it. Um, a lot of people will buy this, especially women will will see it, they'll buy it, they'll get it home. Um, maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't fit, but it's not worth sending, sending away. And even if it does fit, it may only last three or four washings. And then what do you do? You throw it away. Well, then that garbage, or if you take it even to, uh, you know, Goodwill or somewhere in, in that, it ends up in the garbage and um, it takes a long time to uh, uh, to dissolve, to dissolve um, or it gets wrapped up and shipped overseas for them to do something with it. And um, even the companies that were accepting that garbage are no longer accepting it. So we have just this massive amount of cheap fashion and clothes. And, uh, you know, that is a, an example of that, that global impact. So any any when my daughters question whether I should keep hanging on to that sweater that I've been hanging on to for 15 years, I tell them I'm doing it for the environment, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say this is an inflection that requires us to pri prioritize human-centric organizations to recalibrate how energy is spent on technology and people? You know, I think there's a, there's a lot of debate out there around technology and, and to play, uh, you know, kind of replacing people or displacing people and, and uh, you know, for the for the, some of the jobs, absolutely. Some of the, the menial jobs that are, um, you know, that we've put people in place. Um, the inflection point is there are certain things that only humans can do and we need to start putting you know, that consideration of people and humanity with their hopes, dreams, desires, their hearts, their, their innovation, their uniqueness at the center of our ideas and, uh, and our businesses so that we can take advantage of that, um, that real resource, that energy and uh, innovation and, um, you know, just capability that machines cannot do to take forward our, our, our businesses. And, you know, it's, um, there feels sometimes, I think this momentum that technology is going to override us. Uh, if you're really, if you're really trying to differentiate yourself and be competitive for the future, you've got to turn to people and, and un un unleash that, that energy. And, and you see a lot of opportunity out there, right? I mean, as you're looking, you know, you did a lot of research from the past, but now as you look forward, do you see a lot of opportunity in solving these kinds of problems? I do see a lot of opportunity. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It's going to be really hard, right? That uh, Because there is a momentum that is, has really been um, gaining speed over the last, you know, many decades with just the industrialization industrialization of business and how we've we've standardized and optimized for efficiency and output and and a part of that was really um you know kind of scaling down the human uh into these little bitty blocks of of job descriptions 
and uh, and not really asking for the whole person to to come to the to the business with all their experience and, and capabilities. And so, you know, we taught it in business school. We we've 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 baked this in through benchmarking across uh, you know industries and, and and companies. So you know, this mindset is um, it's going to take a lot to to really kind of disrupt. But the opportunity there on the other side of this um, is is really huge. And, um, you know, from my perspective. Uh, and we're going to get at the end, I'm going to ask you to make some projections about uh, what the big opportunities are, because the people on here, um, one of the things I promoted about this particular interview was that you probably have some insights on where the real business opportunities are and what the changes are going to mean and how people can capitalize on it. So. Let's go on with what are the universal laws of business? And you say they've changed. What are they and how have they changed? Well, I think the, the one that is uh, most important uh, perspective from, from the book is this idea that uh, the sole purpose of the business is to maximize shareholder you know, profits. I think that is, I think if you go into, um, still, if you go into most MBA programs um, and ask them what is the sole purpose of business, you will have a bunch of students, you know, saying it is to maximize shareholder profit. If you go into a, a company, you do a lot of consulting with with companies. You ask people, "What is the sole purpose of business?" It is to maximize shareholder profit, right? And um, when you do that inside your organization and you optimize for that that goal. Um, it doesn't allow for a lot of innovation um, or a lot of room for some of these other issues to, uh, to, to kind of creep in. And so that universal law is being, is being challenged because if you're doing everything to optimize shareholder profit, you may not be paying attention to um, your impact on the environment. You may not be um, paying attention to the needs of your employees. Um, and so, you know, that is one of those universal laws that I think it's very interesting because that debate is, is happening, um, you know, right now uh, around uh, the business world as to what is the sole purpose of, of business? And then how do, we, how do we optimize for this more human-centric uh, perspective that many are calling for? My daughter's generation, she's 31, she's got a global marketing practice. She's asking that question every day now, right? That whole generation is looking at it and feel like we haven't done our job and past generations haven't really looked after uh, Mother Earth in a way that allows them to continually be successful. And at the same time, it's become more and more expensive to live on this planet as well. Um, AI is gaining more influence daily. What significant impacts do you project on job displacement and what new opportunities will there be for the people who are being displaced? You know, I think there, again, there's, there's things that, uh, that AI will, will do um, a little bit better uh, than, than humans. And so we, we need to allow that to happen. I think what we need to, to do is think about this as a kind of a human machine team and, um, so the opportunity there is not to, um, you know, not to be worried about AI displa displacing people, but really figure out where is the, the real unique role for, for humans and then people with their uniqueness and how do we rewire our organizations to, uh, to take advantage of that. Um, so I think there, you know, that is the, um, that's kind of the, the challenge. Uh, for organizations, for businesses, this may mean that when you bring on AI systems to do uh, data and data analytics, you may have to train those other people that were in your organization to just not let them go. You may have to offer um, for them to to be uh, to go back to school to be data scientist or you know or strategist or something other than what they've been doing. Um, no, of course, there's always the downsides, the dark side of, of AI that uh, that you know people talk about, and and uh, and and I agree with with a lot of uh, you know knowing what's inside those algorithms. Um, you know, we we've got to do that, 
But that in itself leads to a, an opportunity for people to be able to take on that role rather than just the AI just running in the background and us taking it for granted that it is, um, it's giving us good information. We have a question from the audience. For public companies with shareholders, how do you think uh, you can reset shareholder expectations to allow for change? You know that uh, that's happening now. It's uh, it's happening in the uh, the conversations. I mean, you mentioned Larry Fink, and yeah. uh, and BlackRock. Those conversations are, are happening with uh, you know with the companies that they invest in. Some of the companies that they invest in, you know, they may have 25, 30 percent of the uh, of the funds um, that that company has uh, available to them. And so, you know, it is. Um, Shareholders are also stakeholders. Um, they go home. They are a part of the environment. They are part of the community. Uh, they have they have kids. They have grandkids. So it's not uh, they're not isolated groups. It is uh, very converging groups, if you would. And so um, it is it is to have these discussions and and really talk about um, it's not an either or be profitable or you know serve the broader stakeholders it's really how can we continue to be profitable and to continue to grow while we're taking on some of these other challenges and and there's been a lot of kind of uh case studies and studies that show um for instance if you are doing right for the environment you are probably doing right for for your company financially too yeah, I mean, I think Target and Walmart, they all see that. And we had experience with this, right, in the, I guess the 80s and 90s with South Africa, where shareholders said, you know what, unless things change over there, we're just not going to be investing. And that forced South Africa to have to make a change. And I think that we're seeing that now uh, with the environment and, 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 and with people themselves. Uh, the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 has gone from 75 years to only 15. How do future business leaders adjust and what skills would they need to lead and keep their companies alive? Well, and you know, in some of that data on unfortunately the, uh, the Fortune 500 companies and, and such, um, because they're being acquired, right? They're they're yeah. being acquired, and and many are that are on your uh, your podcast here are probably entrepreneurs that uh, you know someday are thinking about an exit strategy and what that might look like and and uh, and such. I think uh, for keeping it alive um, and to to think about what that uh, what that means long term as to where does your energy and effort and in, in IP go, it is it is really um, for me. I think it is to to be more future focused about where things are going to meet the needs of the future, versus just meeting the needs of of today or even. The momentum of, of yesterday. Um, again, it's looking at um, things like, um, do you have a water management strategy? Everything that we produce um, takes takes on the need for, for water. If your company, and I don't really care how big it is right now, if you don't have a water management strategy, um, you are probably putting yourself at risk long term um, because water is going to be an absolute critical problem that is that is growing, and uh, and our businesses will compete with just you know the human need of of water. General Mike Miley, head the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, said in the past year, they said, "What's the biggest concern of the Joint Chiefs?" He said, "Water." He said, yeah. "That's where the future wars are going to be all over water." Yeah, yeah, I don't remember the the exact percent, but if you look at all the countries across, you know, the 200 countries or whatever it is that we have today, um, if you look at that, most countries, uh, there is a water source that they they border on, you know, and yep. so at least two countries, if not three countries, and, um, you know, water conflict is, um, you know, it's, it's huge, and it's not just uh, geopolitical. I mean, we've got that problem right here in the United States with, uh, 
you know, look at the Western United States, yeah. the water sources, California and Colorado. And, and uh, I was talking to, to somebody I live right now, I live in Utah, and I was talking to somebody, um, a younger person who's just kind of starting out uh, thinking about buying a house. And they're like, I don't know if I want to stay here, because Utah may be totally dry, you know, in the next 10, 15 years. And if there's no water here, what does that mean to, to Salt Lake City? So I, I, I really, I, I agree with that. That is a, a very hard problem that we all have the responsibility to, to, uh, to address. Um, business schools teach students a variety of different things. What classes do you think are now dated uh, in business schools and what do you think they should be teaching to prepare future leaders of, from startups to large corporations. Yeah, the dated is is hard, right? Because inside those those uh, those classes, there is some some uh, some really good information. I think um, one of the things that I think is is really kind of lacking is is leadership. I think we talk a lot about management and how to manage organizations. But I don't think we talk a lot about what is really kind of leadership, which, you know, in the simplest sense is, is just getting other people to, um, you know, to bring out the, the best out of other people to accomplish, you know, goals or, or common goals. And, um, and that leadership is not, uh, you know, is, is not just those that are at the top of the organization and, and uh, being, you know, being uh, coached and mentored on being the C, the next CEO or CEO, that leadership is all over the the, the company, and and what is that? Uh, you know, that kind of that behavior. Um, I think there is a um, there is a interesting class that uh, that we don't talk about either, which is a systems of systems type of kind of thinking. Um, we are so highly connected uh, across our businesses, our personal lives, um, you know, financial institutions and, um, you know, political institutions, regulatory, all these uh, different systems, if you would, uh, impact um, impact a business, impact us in our personal life. And so giving that, you know, kind of that engineering systems of systems perspective, I think is very important for business schools because um, that's the way you'll be a little bit more future focused. You'll be able to identify potential conflict, potential opportunities. If you kind of understand how, something in a different industry or a different market may impact what uh, what you're doing or trying to do. You know, um, one of the big things you talked about in the book is about cultures, about, you know, corporate cultures. And I've had many authors who talk about the importance of corporate culture, that it's not just something nice to write about uh, on the wall, but you have to really think long and hard about how to build the right corporate culture. So what types of culture should leaders develop and will that vary from industry to industry, especially you've been doing this kind of consulting? Yeah. So all businesses have cultures. And, um, you know, even the real toxic uh, businesses that are, are struggling, there is a culture there. And there is a behavior. Um, and culture is just really kind of that expectation and, and, and behavior, expect, uh, expected behavior of the organization. And so, you know, if you promote a, a kind of a, a toxic behavior through either your um, expectations or through what you reward, you're going to have that kind of, um, you know, that you're going to have that kind of business. You know, on the positive side, that it's really that positive culture that um, I think gets, uh, you know, gets a lot of airtime as to, to how do we build a positive, um, you know, positive business culture. And again, I think if you, to do that, you really need to understand what is the purpose of your business? Why do you even exist? Um, you know, at the root of all of it, um, why are we, why are we a business? And, um, 
it's not just to make money because you can make money at doing anything. And, um, and there's a lot of nefarious ways to make money. And so yeah. um, what you really want to do is why are we here? Is it, uh, you know, is it for betterment of people? Is it betterment of environment? Are we trying to solve a hard problem? Is it to be, to be a member of a, a community trying to drive some innovation, whatever that may be, and let your strategy and let your every, your behavior and what you measure um, follow through on on that. It's interesting, I think, if you go to a lot of businesses and ask them to see their dashboard and they say, oh, we're a purpose-driven business, but you look at their dashboard as to what they're measuring every day or week to week or quarter to quarter, and it's cash flow, it's sales, it's profit, it's cost. There's nothing really in there about what they say they are. And, um, you know, that gap between what is really your, your stated purpose and what how you behave is... I think the gap that needs to be filled and addressed. Yeah, dollars still is the ultimate measure of success for businesses and investors at the end of the day. And, and the other things are like, hey, nice to have, but again, you can't even survive long enough to do the things that you're suggesting you know, if uh, the revenue isn't coming in with good profits. Um, Especially in the entrepreneurial, I, I and I understand that. I ran a small business and, and I, and I understand that, but even then, even then you can do smaller baby steps um, and you can behave in such a way that as you grow, you can take on more opportunity to do some of these other things. I, um, I, I agree. I think the under 35 market is um, the profits are important, but it's not the ultimate. And when they sign on for a company, they really do care. And I've heard many of the authors say that when they've interviewed people under the age of, I guess, 35, maybe as high as 40, that's really critical to whether they decide to join an organization because they feel they can make a living anywhere. So they're not trapped like when I'm 61. When I was younger, you only your circle of employment opportunities is as far as your car could take you within an hour's drive time. Now that's all changed. Um, how is increased use of satellites going to change our lives? And there's gazillions of them out there now. <laughs> yeah, they're uh, they are definitely painting the uh, painting the sky. I think they're, I think um, well, uh, we had a, a great example just uh, just recently with the explosion of of the volcano in, in Tonga, and uh, you know we we watched it from space. Um, that uh, that understanding of kind of that remote um, sensing will allow us to to try to figure out um, you know what's going on with our with our Earth. Um, I saw an interesting uh, as another example. I saw a, an interesting statistic that says you know we um, what is it seventy percent seventy five percent of the world is covered with water and we don't yeah. know. We don't know anything about our oceans. We really know very little. We know um, a little bit on what goes on on the surface, but we don't understand what's going on underneath. And so, you know, satellites not only allow us to connect, and it's giving us this global, you know, at some point, 5G capability to where, um, you know, even at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, you may have connectivity. But it also allows us for this remote sensing that allows us to really understand our planet. And, uh, and that understanding will, um, will create all sorts of other innovations and, and uh, capability as, as well as maybe make this a, a better place for all of us to live. You write about the power of social media. How will social media evolve? Because I mean, right now, people fall in one of two ways. Like in the beginning, it was great because you could hear what your friends were doing. And it was kind of like dynamite was, you know, it was to save people's lives by not having mountains fall in on them. But now social media, in many cases, has become a pariah. So how's it going to evolve? What's your view on it? You know, I think it's like any kind of um, new capability. I think, um, you know, I think it, uh, I think it was a curiosity. I think there was, um, you know, we're kind of in that phase of, you um, 
of really kind of irresponsibility, if you would. It was, um, and now I think we'll go into a phase of, of questioning what is our responsibility, not only from a, a business perspective, uh, regulatory perspective, but also from an individual perspective. What are our responsibilities when we have this, um, this capability? I don't think it's gonna go away. I think we're all connected. Um, and I think we'll continue to be connected because our financial, what drives our wealth creation around the world is, uh, is a lot of this connectivity, if you would. So that's not gonna go away. Um, but I do think what we're seeing right now is the question of what should that, the role be? What should our responsibilities, how far should it go? Um, I think, um, you know, for me, my, my hope and um, is, that uh, you know, businesses won't see social media as just as free for all marketing to people to um, to use that uh, those patterns of life and that that information to exploit. That you know, we really do have um, you know a, a, a responsibility. Um, and I think innovations will will pop up all over. And you probably have entrepreneurs over here already thinking about. You know businesses that uh, you know protect that that uh, that that personal data uh, from an individual, and uh, you know kind of uh, shelter or protect that. Um, you know, I can imagine, and I wrote in the book, I can imagine a business where um, they broker. You know, for us as individuals, I will only allow so much of my data to be used. And I want to be compensated with that for that data. It won't be just a, a free for all. And so I think there'll be some other um, industries that pop up and other businesses that will um, will create that balance. Yeah, I, I think so as well. There's always opportunity when there is uh, calamity happening. Just like you know, we've had all this false information that's put on the internet, and now there's you know products being built every day and services to make sure that whatever comes out is uh, backed by fact because, yeah. that, yeah, because that's uh, harming us in a, a significant way. What well, you, and there's not yeah. only just that kind of, you know, there's the, um, this point in, in buy mentality is, you know, it, uh, here, let's let's give you something, Deb, that we know you want. Uh, let's make it super easy for you. That is one click away. Um, you know, there's also a lot of really large consequences of sticking um, a little bit of product into a great big uh, cardboard box and shipping it to me overnight. And um, you know, there's uh, I think there's you know there's a, a lot to be said about how are we going to be more responsible in the future? Uh, yeah, or it costs us that much more, even financially, for the investment you're going to have to make and that if you don't do it sooner than later. Uh, what do you mean by the world is a system of systems? So I talked a little bit about that. And in the book, I talked about, um, you know, we all kind of, we, we all kind of understand there's a financial system. And we all kind of understand there's a regulatory system and we all, you know, inside our businesses, we have our business system. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's all of these kind of interdependent connections between those that one thing can't happen, um, you know, in our business without it affecting somewhere down somebody else's business or affecting something financially or you know at some point um, maybe uh, affecting regulatory and, and policy or vice versa and so you know it, there's very few things anymore that i can think about that are just totally isolated that don't have you know i can't I can't really think of too many things that I could put a wall around and say, this can operate in its own um, without any influence on, uh, from the outside. We're all highly connected. And um, it's, you know, for any of the, the, you know, the people out there right now, if you've heard of the butterfly effect, it really, 
you know, the, the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in, in Brazil creates a, a hurricane across the, the world. I think um, no time in, in history has that ever been so true is to, to now. I mean, you can just watch the, the news and somebody, somebody makes a, a statement and um, stock goes up, stock goes down, um, you know, something happens. Um, so we need to take a more systems of systems perspective of our business and in our decisions, um, you know, and, and how we go forward. I think it's amazing when you look at COVID that one person got infected and it literally raced around the entire planet Earth that there's no part of the planet, essentially, there's very remote places that somebody hasn't gotten this. I mean, that's the real <laughs> definition yeah. of a viral effect, right? Yeah, yeah. So what is modern complexity theory and, and why is that important for us to know? Well, I think it's it's very much in what we just talked about is um, these, uh, you know, the, the systems of systems perspective has really created an increase of, of complexity. And, um, you know, the way I like to think about it is, you know, many, many, many years ago, uh, we were playing kind of, you know, two dimensional chess, we would make a move, there would be a counter move, uh, we would make another move to that counter move, and there would be another counter. Now we play, um, you know, we play three-dimensional or four-dimensional chess. I mean, any of the, the Star Trek fans out there remember the, the chess games and then the, the multi-layers. Well, a move on this plane can actually affect another move up on, uh, on another plane. And so, you know, that is really, um, you know, thinking about the complexity, thinking about interdependencies, um, the consequences of of a decision, not just in your direct consequence, but a secondary or tertiary um, effect is, um, has really um, become important for today's leaders. And I think, you know, many of them may do it a little bit intuitively, but there's a practice there that, um, you know, would uh, make them stronger at that uh, and needed for, um, you know, for, for the future. That you way they're were, not blindsided, you know, they're, or tend to be less blindsided, I guess, if you would. Yeah, for sure. You write about the importance of uh, foundational priorities. What is that and why is it important for a country, even a company to succeed? Well, when, uh, you know, again, it's uh, when you have those, those foundational priorities, everything comes from, from that perspective, right? It, uh, you're not being whipsawed around something that may be happening in the market. You may not be, you know, you, you, you fight the urge, I guess, to, to, to react. When you, um, when you are more future focused, when you ask the what ifs about the future, when you do that with a sense of, of opening up the aperture for your data collection about those what ifs, um, having, having that foundation, you're less likely to be um, kind of pushed into a, a decision or an action that is reactive, that you are more proactive in, in, in your course because you have that foundational belief. Is there any companies or countries or both that you think are doing this well? You know, there's there's one um, there's one company that I'm really kind of um, intrigued by, and I write about him in the the book. It's uh, Dan Price is the CEO of a company called uh, Gravity Payments, and I have that um, in my questions here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting because the company's been around now I don't know ten years, twelve years, and um, you know, he started out as a very young CEO and um, probably much like um, the, uh, you know, what he learned in, in business school and other businesses, it was, you know, here's how it's structured, here's how we think about business, here's how we, we think about compensation. And, um, you know, it was a, a moment of time that uh, they're based out of Seattle. It was a moment of time he was having a discussion with one of his employees that said, you know, Dan, you, 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 uh, you, you talk about being responsible to employees and, and, uh, but you're not walking the talk. And 
Um, and so it was right after that, it was really kind of, it sounds like a very, you know, traumatic turning point in his perspective about business that he decided to, to kind of go to a flat salary across, um, you know, across the business. And, and he took a significant salary cut because he, he did his, you know, and it took him a couple of years to do this. And, like and 90% cut. Yeah, like 90%. And, and the like, COO who he lured to the company from, I think, Yahoo took, as I read in the book, 83% yeah. cut to come to him. Um, and I'm wondering, by the way, how did, I understand with him because he has all this equity, but for her, um, how did she make up for that? Why would she even show up for that loss of income? Yeah. Well, because again, sometimes income is not the only thing. If you're if you're getting what you need financially, and that was kind of the debate and the challenge to to him as a as a leader was, look, you've got employees that can't even make a living here. They're right. they're struggling. They can't. And so he looked at what uh, what it would take. You know, was, I think it was seventy five thousand at the time or whatever it was to to be able to live live a good life, not extravagant life, but at least to be able to, to feed your children and, and, uh, and, and, you know, have shelter over your head. Um, and he, he flat rated and, you know, the company's still in business. The company's still growing, even through the pandemic, the company, um, is, uh, is thriving and partly because, um, his employees are engaged you know, when it came down to the very beginning of the, the pandemic, he, he said, what do we do? And, you know, from, from what is all written and the, the discussions that were had is, is there, the employee said, look, I can take a, a little bit of a pay cut to help these people and I can do this and I can do that. The company for the good of the company and for the people in the company, they decided the strategies. It didn't come from just the top. And, um, you know, I think that's, uh, now we don't know, you know, how this company will go in the future, but they've been around a long time. And, um, you know, he was pretty chastised when he did this. It was, that will never work. Uh, this is a flash in the pan. Um, so, you know, kudos to him with the, the, the courage. And, but I do think that that gives a, an example of, you know, when your employees are truly engaged, you know, it's because they want the place to succeed. Most, most places don't have engaged employees. Yeah, the, um, I think it's less than 42% of employees feel engaged. I think I read in a study and, and I've read studies that say as low as 12% yeah. uh, feel engaged. And certainly he's bought a ton of loyalty and that the turnover is probably got to be next to nothing. We do the same thing in the building I live in Philadelphia that we give quarterly bonuses to all the employees and we've had nobody leave in three years yeah. uh, for that. Uh, question from the audience. Elon Musk believes a minimum basic salary will need to be provided by government since technology will eliminate many jobs uh, due to AI and other technical advances. Do you, excuse me one second, do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with the government taking uh, taking this on. I don't think that's the role of the, the government. I do think that that, that is the, the role of, of business and business employers um, to think about that. And, um, you know, that's one of the, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a big government um, person. I think the, the government does have a role, but the government doesn't have um, the role of making sure that your employees have a fair wage, especially given um, right now, there are a lot of um, salaries that are pretty out of whack, CEO salaries that are out of whack compared to uh, the percentage yeah. that the employees are getting. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen his statement on that, um, but I've seen other things written. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's really what he believes, um, you know, totally, because I don't think Elon Musk is a big government guy either. Yeah, no, for sure not. And it's funny, back in the 80s, uh, CEOs were embarrassed for people to find out that they made 60 times the average worker. But now you have many CEOs uh, making 3,000 times uh, the average worker. And it's, it's crazy across the board from sports to corporate America. Um, why is Antarctica important and how could it 
how could this affect the world? I, I was interested in knowing more about that. So again, this is a example. This is a great example of a systems of systems. We have this uh, this this continent down there that's like ninety eight percent ice, and um, and it also holds the world's ninety percent of the. I think that's roughly the number of the world's fresh water. And um, if the Antarctic goes away, if that ice goes away, this is a real. It does. It's not only you know the oceans rise. But this is a part of our ecological kind of fresh water um, uh, effect for um, us on the on the planet. And so, you know, we don't um, most people don't get to travel to Antarctic. Um, and uh, I was I had the great opportunity to do that a few years ago. Um, it's very, very hard to get there. Only about 50,000 people uh, travel there a year. It's expensive, it's dangerous to get there. Um, but it is a place where um, all of us um, kind of rely on it and, and probably don't even know about it. Right now, it is not owned by, by anybody. There's a signed uh, agreement uh, across some you know, four dozen countries that say, you know, the Antarctica is, is only there for research, that no one country owns it. Um, they don't allow drilling, they don't allow uh, any kind of uh, construction, anything like that. Um, but that agreement comes up in, in uh, you know, very soon in the next, I think, 10 or 15 years. And right now, there's already companies and countries wanting to go in, drill, mine, take the resources out of that area. Um, the Chinese, um, not to bash the Chinese, but the, the Chinese are actively pursuing um, and some of the oil companies to go in and drill. Um, that could really make it create a, a real um, uh, environment imbalance that uh, <laughs> would just speed up the speed up the consequences yes yeah it'd be catastrophic right it, it could be very catastrophic and and most people don't even know because it's not in front of us you know just like most people don't even really understand the oceans except for what they can see off the beach you know it uh the oceans play a very very important uh role no matter where you live in in our health and our water and our food and and all of that you mentioned mental models. Uh, what are they and how should leaders use them? Yeah, mental models are just those things of what we believe uh, of what we believe how things work. And, um, you know, there are there are mental models that we um, that we develop through our education or experience that we say, well, this is just how it is. And um and and when people challenge those you know we rely back on and say well no that's not that's not correct and so the, what i talk about these mental models are you know we need to we need to to consider that there might be other models out there a great example i think is this model of being shareholder primacy you know well the sole purpose of a business is to maximize shareholder profit that is a mental model that many people carry around um is that truly true, um, especially in today's age? It might have been 50 years ago. May, we may have needed that 50 years ago to um, mature the industrial model of business. But today, that, uh, that mental model doesn't serve us very well because it doesn't allow um, new kind of thinking, uh, which you know is, is open to innovation and opportunities. So, um, you know, having these kind of understanding of what our own mental models are, why do we believe the things that we believe, and then and then allowing ourselves to challenge those and create new mental models um, is is really important. Uh, I thought this was interesting because uh, I really didn't know much of the story. Can you talk about how Wikipedia came into being and what we can learn from its success related to human centric? mindset because the first time these guys tried to do it it was to it didn't it didn't take 
it was a disaster. And I think they were called Newpedia or something like that. Yeah. And they, they based it off of, you know, the model that they used was, was kind of based on the encyclopedia model. We're going to have people write, we're going to go through this review process, we're going to give it to, um, you know, a very extensive review process. Um, these, these reviewers will be experts in the field. It will take, you know, in, in, in all of that kind of bureaucracy that, that existed there when, uh, when we were creating encyclopedias in the, you know, the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s, um, they had, uh, you know, that's the model that they used to do this online. And, um, you know, I think their first year, I, I think it was, you know, 18, 30 different kind of, you know, writings because it was so onerous and you couldn't get anything uh, uh, posted and, um, and it wasn't very useful to, to people. And so, you know, it, they had kind of a, a, a change of mental model and they said, wait, let's, let's not have all this structure here. Let's, let's have some very simple rules. And if you go to, um, you can Google the, the simple rules of Wikipedia, and they've kind of followed that. Um, you know, it's uh, be responsible if, if you see something that doesn't seem right, um, you know, challenge that. But they, but they use the human network to drive that growth. And, um, you know, I think that is, uh, you know, it's a great example of, of human centric um, because most people that are posting, are taking that responsibility because they're being checked by the global population, right? And the more Wikipedia matures, the more they're sourcing. You can check those sources, um, and uh, and there's there's challenges. And so when they opened up that idea, when they opened up their their mental model to really a a, a power of human network, it created a, a real opportunity for them. Yeah, I. And of course, now we're all super happy about it and we reference it all the time. And I myself, I'm glad to be part of it. Uh, why doesn't the top-down management style work anymore? And is this a permanent change or because of the pace of change, will other models be evolving? Yeah, I don't think it doesn't work anymore because one, one person at the very top or a small group of people at the very top can't know uh, everything that's needed across the uh, the organization. Um, you know, there's a there's kind of a an example like uh, you know the the people that study volcanoes, right? There's there's people that study them way back in the uh, back in the office or back in the organization, but there's people that are are, are putting the sensors out on the rims of the of the volcanoes. They're kind of the ones that uh, are knowing what is really happening with that volcano right at that moment. And so, you know, in a highly connected organization, um, you can't just make all decisions or make all directions from the top. I do think there's respon different responsibilities at the top for sure, but uh, we've got to kind of push those decisions and um, that leadership and that awareness to to the ends of the the organization and that's a very very different uh, different structure than than what we've had in the past yeah israeli military has been using that structure for a long time of the tip of the spear making the decisions not the people uh at the end of the spear uh, making those things and they do that in their companies as well you know it's kind of interesting just think about our modern uh, companies right now and you've got uh you know, you've got the, your your IT person, and you've got your marketing person, and you've got your R and D, and you've got human resources. Um, a lot of the the issues are, and the challenges and the opportunities of a business are highly connected across all those functional, and no one can solve that. So what happens in the current structure is it all gets bounced up to the CEO or you know the, the C-suite to make the decision. How is it possible that that small group of people will know all the intricate details of each one of those functions to best make that decision? It's, it, we're not making our best decisions. And so we really have to think about different kinds of behaviors and, um incentive structures to kind of push 
that down and allow for that that uh, problem integrated integrated disciplinary problem solving um, down further into the organization. You mentioned that although technology was supposed to make decision making more efficient, it hasn't worked out that way and has added layers of influencers into the mix. Why is that and how is that affecting innovation? <laughs> well, just think about it inside your own organization. How many emails you you uh, you yeah. get put on, right? How many emails? How many people can say no? How many people can challenge? How many can people can say, well, you know, um, what is this about? And every time you have to answer one of those questions, um, it's taking up, uh, you know, taking up time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of studies that say, you know, a lot of these management uh, technology management uh, suites are are actually creating more work, more time, because you're answering and you're reading and you're, you're having to inform people. Um, one of the really valuable tools as a, as a program manager is something called a RACI matrix. And uh, RACI stands for responsibility. Um, the, the R is who is responsible. The A is who is accountable. C is who, who do we have to communicate to? And, uh, and I is just who do we have to inform? And most companies right now don't ever use that. And so everybody that has a title or feels like they have a stake in any kind of discussion can come to the meeting, jump on an email, have to be informed, has a right to say something. Um, which really cuts down that efficiency. And so there are tools out there that we can use to say, you know, I'm informing you, but you're not, you're not a part of this dialogue. And, uh, and that might make us more efficient again and use that technology uh, more efficient. But um, yeah, it's, we've, we've created, uh, we've created, we've, we've kind of flattened the organization without really giving accountability. Therefore, we've added a lot of ambiguity to how is this decision going to be made or this action going to be executed, which tends to be, it doesn't get executed very quickly anymore. I think people also are afraid of putting their necks on the line. And so they're afraid to get, it's going to get chopped off. And so they, they push it up, uh, up the ranks. Uh, in the book, and we have time for maybe just two more questions. In the book, you mentioned about how knowledge doubles every 13 months. What stretches, stresses me out because it makes me feel you can't get ahead for a reasonable period of time. You mentioned the overwhelming amount of info is hampering companies. How are companies or even society able to manage and determine what to keep and discard? Well, and I also talk about um, a, a concept that uh, Alvin Toffler kind of coined, which was obsolete, obsolete knowledge, right? It's a... Uh, Yes, knowledge is be create, being created. Content is being created. You know, at the speed of at the speed of heat, um, it doesn't mean that it's good. It doesn't mean that it's relevant. It doesn't mean that it's still current. And so, with this idea, is you know how much how much do we we keep? How much do we need? Um, and what is obsolete? And you know, going going forward. Um, an example of obsolete knowledge, I think, you know, people our age grew up thinking that Pluto was a planet. Well, it's no longer a planet, it's some kind of mini planet, and it's not even a part of, you know, it's 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 there still, but it's not categorized the same way that we learned. That's pretty obsolete. The idea of seven continents, well, maybe we don't, maybe we have more, they're always shifting. Um, and so, you know, companies need to be aware that more data is not always, um, you know, always the best. The, the temporal aspect of data becomes very, very important. When do you need that data? You don't need it for all time because it will lose its value over time. You know, how do you tap in when you need it? Um, for what purpose do you need it? Um, I think becomes very, very important. And the temporal aspect is something that we need to be very aware of. Deborah, I have to say, I so thank you for taking the time and for all of you to come on because this was my 100th show today. Congratulations. And, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and thanks to a lot of you who I uh, see on here who have been listening from the get-go and have listened to about 100 shows. So you're probably uh, super happy to hear 
the authors, but tired of hearing my voice over a hundred shows. But Deborah, thank you so much. It's a great book. Uh, you provide us all with a lot of great insights and things to think about and how we're going to manage our own businesses and our personal investments. Everybody have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you all next Friday uh, when we have our next author. Have a great thanks, weekend, Mark. everybody. Please yeah, stay safe. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you.